Here's what's going on this week at ALCF. Ladies, big plans to attend the women's 12th annual Christmas tea, Emmanuel God With Us. It promises to be a memorable event with great food, praise, and worship by Michelle Lewis and friends, along with a special message from Margie Fennell. This event takes place on Saturday, December 14th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Join us for Seniors Night Out, a great opportunity to meet and bond with other 50-plus seniors for a memorable night of fellowship, delicious food, a message from Pastor Gary Anderson, and worship led by Stan Carlson. This event takes place on Friday, October 11th from 6.30 to 9 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. If you are new to Abundant Life and want to learn about our story, vision, and values, be sure to join us for our complimentary guest luncheon, This is ALCF. The event takes place after service on Sunday, October 27th from 12 to 1 p.m. in the chapel. If you've ever been interested in ministry at ALCF or wanted to develop as a leader, be sure to check out our monthly leadership community gatherings. It's a great opportunity to connect with and learn from other church leaders who can equip you with tools to help you grow your gifts and leadership skills. Our next meeting takes place on Saturday, October 26th from 10.30 a.m. to noon in the chapel. If you are 18 to 30-ish and looking to go deeper in your walk with a community of others in your season of life, come hang out with our Young Adults group for a fun-filled evening of games, events, speakers, group discussions, and more. Let's meet up on Friday, October 11th and 25th from 7 to 9 p.m. in Allies 2. Mom's Time Out is a great opportunity for mothers to relax, refresh, and refuel. Our theme this year is Fear Not, Learning to Rest in God's Love. And this month, we'll be joined by our guest speaker, Elizabeth Sharp, along with our special Mentor Moms panel. Come join other moms in the ALCF community on October 10th and 24th from 10 a.m. to noon in the Fellowship Hall. To sign up for any of these upcoming events, go to alcf.net slash signups or check out the ALCF app. And remember, Abundant Life exists to make a better you for a better world. Let's pray. Now, Father God, we ask that you would speak to us. Got anything done week after week has the possibility of becoming routine. And God, I pray that you would prevent this moment from being routine. I pray that you would fill this room with your spirit, that you would be so present with us that it's tangible. God, all of us need to hear from you. All of us need to be with you. And so we ask that as we now study your word, they would not just be ink on a page, but they would literally come alive because your word is living and active and you are the living God. So speak to us now, God, we ask. Remove from our minds distractions and fears and concerns and focus our attention on one thing and one thing alone, and that is you. We need you. We love you. And we ask that you would speak to us now. I pray that you would speak through me. I pray that you would take away anything that you don't want me to say. And I pray that you would give me everything that you do want me to say. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you have done. We can do nothing except you are our center. So be our center, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Isn't worship wonderful today? Now, Now, I need to not screw it up. Uh, Wasn't my wife wonderful? Uh, We are in a uh, we're in a series called Impossibly Christian. We are studying Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, found in Matthew chapters five, six, and seven. We're in the Beatitudes, and we again this week have just one verse that we're going to study. Today we are in Matthew five eight, Matthew chapter five verse eight, and it says this. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In 1980, the director, writer, actor, comedian, entertainer, whatever he is, Woody Allen, began a relationship with the actress Mia Farrow. 
Now, they both had had previous relationships, and Mia actually brought seven children into that relationship, three biological and four adopted. Two of those adopted children were from Vietnam, two from South Korea. Over the next 12 years, uh, Woody and Mia were in a relationship. Though they never actually moved in together, they had a biological child together as well as adopted another child. In 1992, it became public that Woody Allen had started a romantic relationship with one of Mia Farrow's adopted children, Soon Yi. At the time, Woody Allen was 56, and because adoption records were not clear, Soon Yi was somewhere between 19 and 21. For those of you who are old enough to remember, you will remember that was quite a scandalous revelation. For those of us who are too young to remember, you can imagine that that would have been a very scandalous revelation. Woody Allen actually put out a statement that summer of 1992 declaring his love for Soon Yi, and he sat with a Time Magazine reporter for an interview. As you can imagine, the questions were of the nature, what actually is going on here? And very famously, Woody Allen said at the end of that interview, in trying to explain what was going on with his relationship with Soon Yi, he said, the heart wants what it wants. The heart wants what what it wants. Now, I think I can speak for probably a, a, a good chunk of us in here, maybe all of us, and say there's something that is unsettling about that situation I just described. It, it doesn't pass the smell test, right? Even if maybe legally there were no issues, just something didn't seem right. But what we need to recognize in the moment is that what Woody Allen was saying was he was really pronouncing one of the primary beatitudes of our culture or of our world. He was just saying, hey, I'm just following my heart. And though he didn't say it, the follow-up to that would be, so who are you to tell me that I'm wrong? See, one of the primary values that our culture tries to instill in us is this idea that you are blessed, you are happy, you are favored if you follow your heart, if you listen to your heart. That's one of our world's highest values. The great tragedy for me this week in preparing this sermon is that I have had Roxette's 1988 hit, Listen to Your Heart, stuck in my head all week. The second great tragedy is that everyone in here who knows that now has it stuck in your head. You're, you're welcome. See, see, Woody Allen was just saying, hey, I'm just following my heart, and we live in a culture that celebrates that, right? You want, you want that new car? You can't quite afford it but you really want it, go ahead and buy it. Your heart will thank you, and we'll celebrate you for doing it. Not happy with who you're with, or find someone you like better? Doesn't matter what commitment you made, follow your heart, and we'll tell you you were brave for doing so. See, we live in a culture that tells us following our hearts is one of the most valiant things we can do, but can I let you in on a little secret? It's a euphemism. You know what it really means? Do whatever you want. Do whatever you want regardless of the consequences. Look out for number one, live your truth. But as he always does, Jesus comes on in and messes the whole thing up. Because we're all like, follow your heart and that's the path to the blessed life. And Jesus comes along and he says, actually, clean your heart. Purify your heart. And then you will find the blessed life the favored life, the happy life, when you actually do something that goes against what your heart wants you to do, then you will find the blessed life. And he doesn't say it in this verse we're studying today, but we know just based on the biblical context that Jesus would actually say, you're going to get in a lot of trouble if you try and follow your heart before I've gotten a hold of it. And all we need to do is look at the guy we just talked about. Woody Allen is now in his 80s. And what has following his heart done to him? He has a life that, that, while very successful by the world's standards, he has left just a trail of broken relationships and hurt people, and in recent years has had very, very serious allegations levied against him of doing some really terrible things, especially to young women. No, no, no. The Bible tells us Jesus would say, your heart is infected. It's infected with an infection called sin. And if you try and follow it before I get a hold of it, 
you are setting yourself up for a lot of, check it, heartache. You're setting yourself up for a lot of heartache if you try and follow your heart before I've gotten a hold of it. So, sounds good. <laughs> How do we actually live that out, right? Is that, is that even possible? So when we look at our verse today, we're going to try and answer three questions that, that this verse raises. First is this. What is a pure heart? What is Jesus talking about when he says, blessed are the pure in heart? The second, second thing we're trying to answer is, how do we get it? How do we get one of those? And then the third question we need to answer is, why do we need one? Why do we need a pure heart? So what is a pure heart? How do we get it? And why do we need it? For those of you who are here for the first time today or here for the first time back in a long time, as I just mentioned, we're in the, the early stages of a series teaching through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. It's Jesus' most famous teaching. It's his longest teaching. And we're calling it Impossibly Christian. Because the sense that you should get as you read this message, as you read this sermon, as you hear the things that Jesus says, is that what he is asking me to do is impossible. See, God gave the Israelites a law back in the Old Testament, in Exodus, the second book of the Old Testament. And he said, if you obey this law, you'll get tons of blessing. He's like, if you, if you don't obey this law, there are going to be consequences. And the rest of the Old Testament, from Exodus through the end, that's like 80% of our Bible, is basically the story of how impossibly poorly the Israelites did trying to live up to that law. They failed miserably. And then here comes Jesus in the New Testament, the God, God himself who wrote that law back in Exodus, and he comes onto the scene and he says, hey, I know that law was really hard to follow. The bar was set too low. I'm raising it even higher. So it used to be that if you committed adultery with someone, you broke the law. But I'm telling you, if you have lusted, where? In your heart, you've broken the law. It used to be that if you killed somebody, you broke the law. But now I'm saying, if you hate someone, where? In your heart, you've broken the law. See, the heart is the last place we expect to find purity. And yet here comes Jesus saying, you need to be pure in your heart. So the message of the, of the Sermon on the Mount is that you cannot live up to this. That's the point. And it's not supposed to discourage us from following Jesus, is it? It's supposed to drive us right to him. Because he is the one who can live up to it. And he does and he will on our behalf. Th thank you. So with that, let's try and figure out what he's talking about when he says, blessed are the pure in heart. The first thing we need to talk about is this word heart. Now Jesus in this moment is not talking about the physical organ that pumps blood through our body. He is talking about much more the inner life of someone or of, of a Christian. So when, when the Bible talks about the heart, that is different than what we think of the heart today. So today when we talk about the heart, you know, don't, don't tell my achy breaky heart, listen to your heart, follow your heart, let me show you the shape of my heart, all those things, what we're primarily talking about is emotions. It's our desires. It's our feelings. That's encapsulated in the biblical idea of the heart, but it's much more than that. The biblical idea of the heart was both emotions and our intellect and our will. So the heart in the biblical sense is the entire inner person. It's our inner self. It's not just our feelings. It's everything. It's what we think. It's what we feel. The heart is the entire inner person. Now, when Jesus says you need a pure heart, we need to hang out on this word pure for a minute. The Greek word for pure is katharos. We get our words today like cathartic, catharsis, and catheter from that Greek root word. When we talk about something being cathartic, what are we saying? It's a purging. All of those words have to do with purging. It's getting rid of junk that is unwanted. I don't, I'm not going to go into detail, but I know a lot of us know what a catheter is and how it works. What is a catheter used for? To purge the junk out of something that is not supposed to be there. So when Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, he is talking about an inner life that has been purged, that has been cleansed, that has been cleaned of everything that shouldn't be there. And we can take it one step further. It is not just a state of being that Jesus is talking about, it's a way of life. Because we know from the biblical context 
as Jesus says just a few chapters later in Matthew, that our heart is the source of everything we say and do. So look with me at Matthew chapter 12, verses 34 and 35. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, and he says this, You brood of vipers, that'll get their attention. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. So don't miss this. When Jesus is saying, blessed are the pure in heart, when he's talking about the pure in heart, this is what he is saying. He's saying, you are blessed when your inner life and your outer life are congruent. When what you say and do on the outside matches what is on the inside. It's what the Bible calls other places single-mindedness. And again, later in, in the book of Matthew, Jesus blasts the Pharisees again because their inner life and their outer life don't match. He calls them whitewashed tombs. He says, you look really good and clean on the outside, but inside you're full of death and bones. So Jesus is saying, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those whose inner life and outer life are congruent. Some of you may be aware that Halloween is coming upon us. I've been aware since July, because that's when my kids start talking about what they want to dress up for as Halloween, or for Halloween, excuse me. When I was growing up, there was a stretch, now I may, be, I may be exaggerating this a little bit, there was a stretch of about five or six years in a row that I was the same thing for Halloween. I was a shepherd. Bathrobe, towel, stick. I think my folks were like, if we're going to do this, we're at least going biblical. All my friends were G.I. Joes and Ninja Turtles. And I was wearing a bathrobe with stonewashed jeans sticking out the bottom. <laughs> I wanted so badly to be a real character. I wanted so badly to be a character that had a mask. I wanted so badly to be able to pretend I was somebody I was not. And I see it in my own kids now. They can't wait for Halloween to pretend to be somebody they're not. The problem is a lot of us are still doing that as adults. It's pretty innocent as children, and please don't hear me knocking, dressing up in costumes or playing pretend. It's great. I do it with my, sometimes I do it with my kids. I was just going to say I do it all the time, but that's, that's not true. But the problem is when we get to be adults and we continue to want to wear masks depending on where we're at. I remember so clearly early in my business career going to a business dinner with some people that I went to church with. And in my youthful naivety, I remember being so taken aback by these people that I sat and worshiped with on Sunday, the jokes they were telling, the jokes they were laughing at, the language they were using, the amount of alcohol they were consuming. See, the temptation for all of us is to put on a mask and be somebody we think the crowd wants us to be when we're in that crowd. And look, we can do it in reverse too. It's not just negative. We can do it when we come to church. And I think a lot of us do. We come in here and we put on a mask and we make things look like they're great and we're happy and life is good when really we're really struggling and we're going through some really hard things. And here comes Jesus saying, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who are the same when they are alone in their closet or when they're in the middle of a crowd. He's saying, blessed are those who are the same when they are in church as they are in their living room or the boardroom or the locker room. Blessed are the pure in heart. Jesus is talking about a congruence of our inner life and our outer life. All right? So pure in heart. We good? Let's, let's move on to our next second question. Not, now, we've, we've talked about what does it mean to be pure in heart. Secondly, we're going to look at how do we get a pure heart. This all sounds good, but the problem is we can't do it. We can't do it on our own. We do not have the ability, if there is any message that you see through the whole of this book, it is that you cannot clean yourself up. There is not enough bleach, OxyClean, and steel wool in the world for us to clean our own hearts, and Jesus knows this. I want to take you to one of my favorite passages in all of the Bible. It's found in Ezekiel chapter 36. The context is this. Ezekiel was a prophet in the Old Testament. As we just talked about, God gave the, old, the Israelites in the Old Testament a law. He said, if you obey it, tons of blessings coming on you. If you don't obey it, major consequences. 
Well, they don't obey it. And finally, ultimately, God allows his chosen people to be conquered by a foreign nation and taken off as prisoners of war into captivity. Ezekiel is ministering during this period, during the exile, when for the nation of Israel, all seems lost. They are as good as dead. There is no sense that God has, has any favor, that God is helping them out at all, that he's doing anything to help them or restore them to where he promised them they would be. And then Ezekiel chapter 36, God tells them this. This starts in verse 24. God tells the Israelites, who deserve nothing, they deserve to be cut off. And he says this, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. What does God tell his children? How do you get a pure heart? You need a heart transplant. And I am the great physician who can do it for you. We cannot do it on our own. And so God comes along and he says, your heart, which has been so infected by sin that it is as good as dead, I'm going to take it out and I'm going to give you a new heart, a heart of flesh, a pure heart. So Jesus is blessed are the pure in heart and you don't have to do it on your own because I will actually do it for you. Now, some of you might be sitting here and thinking, yeah, I'm not so sure that actually happens because I know a bunch of people who call themselves Christians and their heart doesn't look that different from anybody else's. I saw something this week that I know a lot of you saw as well and I was so moved by it, I couldn't help but talk about it this morning. Uh, as I know a lot of you know and saw this, this week the trial for the woman who killed Botham Jean, innocent man in his own apartment, last year in Dallas. She was a policewoman, Amber Geiger. She apparently thought it was her apartment. She broke into it and killed the man who was innocently watching football in his own apartment. This week, she was found guilty of murder, and she's now in prison. And at her sentencing, Botham Jean's younger brother, 18-year-old Brant Jean, gave a victim impact statement. I, 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 I don't want to be melodramatic. It is literally one of the most powerful things I've ever seen in my life. He sat in front of that courtroom and looked at his brother's murderer, and he said, if you are really sorry, I forgive you. And if you ask God, he will forgive you too. He said, I love you just like I love anybody else, and I want the best for you. And the best would be for you to give your life to Christ. And then he asked the judge if he could give her a hug, and he did. That is not natural. That does not come from someone following their heart or living their truth or doing what the heart wants. That comes from someone whose heart of stone has been supernaturally transplanted with a heart of flesh, and it has allowed his inner life to match his outer life in a way that would be utterly impossible, except for God working to cleanse his heart. Now that is an extreme example. But I want you all to hear that this room is full of people who can testify that God has done the same thing for them. This room is full of people who can testify that I had a heart of stone and that God has replaced it with a heart of flesh. And so I live and act and do things today that I couldn't have imagined doing before I met God. See, the message again of this book is that all of creation is infected with an infection. And that infection is called sin. And that infection has infected our heart and we can't clean it up but God can do it for us. And when he does, when God gives us a pure heart, our lives will look so radically different from the world's that people won't even think we are real people. Dallas Willard says, when you live out of a pure heart, people will question whether you're actually a real person because it will be so contrary to how they expect people to live their lives. When God gives us a pure heart, we will be able to look at someone who has grossly harmed us or hurt someone we love and say, I forgive you. When we have a pure heart, we will do things like sacrifice our time and our money to serve people who can't help us out in any way but need our help and will do it. 
When, when we live out of a pure heart, when we get passed over for the promotion that we should have gotten, we'll congratulate the person who got the job that should have been ours and put our head back down and continue doing the best we can. When God replaces our heart of stone with a heart of flesh, our lives will look radically different. Not because it's easy, not because it comes naturally, but because we have the power of God living inside of us. So, what is a pure heart? A pure heart is one that has been cleansed and purged and one that is seen in the way that someone lives their life. How do we get a pure heart? God has to do it for us. God has to literally give us a heart transplant. And the last question we need to answer is why? Why do we need a pure heart? And in this, we're just going to look at the second half of the verse. Jesus tells us, blessed are the pure in heart. Why? For they shall see God. Now, uh, this is a clear allusion to Psalm 24. Look at Psalm 24, verses 3 to 5 with me. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So what are both of these passages saying, Psalm 24 and Matthew 5, 8? That those who are pure in heart, that is a prerequisite to come into God's presence. If you want to be with God, you got to have a pure heart. And what is the major thrust of both of these? It's eternity, right? There's an eschatological, that's a fancy word for end times, there's an eschatological sense to these verses that those who are pure in heart will see God, will spend eternity in his presence. As one scholar I read this week said, and that is the greatest reward, for it encompasses all other rewards. Theologians call seeing God the beatific vision. Every longing and desire of our hearts will be fulfilled when we behold God face to face. That is clear and true, and it is an amazing promise. But here's what I want us to hear today. This is eschatological, but it is also a promise for the here and now. Jesus is saying the pure in heart will see God. The pure in heart will see who, the God who Paul in Colossians calls the invisible God, who the writer of Hebrews says the God who is unseen. Those who are pure in heart will have their eyes open to God. He will reveal himself to you in this life. That is an amazing promise that I think we take for granted a lot. Those who are pure in heart will see God in a way that those who are not never will be able to. <clears throat> uh, several years ago, my wife instituted a routine that we do at dinner time. She uh, instituted three questions that we all try and answer over dinner. They are, uh, what was the best part of your day? What was something hard about today? And how did you see God today? Now, as Beth told you guys earlier, we have four relatively young kids. And so I don't want you to get kind of a leave it to beaver, like beautiful image of what dinner time is like at my house. It is a very special form of chaos. More often than not, there is a significant meltdown from somebody, you, usually me. <laughs> so this isn't like it's perfect every night, but, but as many nights as we're able to, we try and answer, answer, all of us, just go around the table and answer these three questions. What was, what was the best part of your day? What was something hard today? And how did you see God today? And so at some level, that's just we want to hear about each other's lives and find out how our days were. But there's a discipleship, an intentional discipleship mechanism built into that because we want our kids to be thinking about the fact that all day long they can see God because he's working in their lives and he's working in the lives of people around them and he's working in the world around them. And we want them to be on the lookout for how God is at work in their lives. Now, it's been interesting to see over the years, for me personally, how sometimes it's really easy to answer that question, and sometimes it's really hard to answer that question. I have gone through some dark seasons in my life where it is really hard to answer the question, how did you see God today? Just about four years ago, we quit our, we, we blew up our lives, quit our career, left family, friends, church, and went to seminary. And that was a really dark season for me. The, the great irony is I am literally studying God's word full time 
And at the end of every day, when the question comes, how did you see God today? Most days, I wasn't sure how to answer it. And yet what has happened is God has brought me through that season and into another one. I've come to a place now where there's some nights, there's not enough time at dinner to talk about all the ways I saw God today. And not only that, I can look in the rear view and I can see in that season that was so dark for me that though I couldn't see it in the moment, God was still working. I see his hand and I see his leading and I see his providence even though in the moment it wasn't clear. And that's true for a lot of us here today. I know there are some of us here today who are like, I see God, he's working, he's in my life, I know it, and it's awesome. But I also know there are some people here today who are like, I am crying out to God. I am longing to see him, and I am getting no vision whatsoever. I know it because I've talked to you about it. I speak with people back in my office all the time who are going through really, really crummy things, really hard things in life. And, and, and you sit back there and they say, where is God? Where is he in this? And why won't he show himself? And why won't he give me a sign? And why won't he tell me what is going on? And why won't he relieve this pressure? I just want you to hear because it is the promise of this verse, God has not abandoned you. He is working in your life. And there is a plan and a purpose and, and it, whatever you are going through, there is a sanctifying in it. And I trust, because I've experienced it myself, that someday you are con- going to come to a place where you can answer the question, how did you see God today? Clearly and definitively. And not only that, you will be able to look back on this season that you are in right now and you will be able to say, he was working in the moment even though I couldn't feel it at the time. Blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. In eternity, yes, but right here, right now, today, in this life. I, I find 2 Chronicles chapter 11. Uh, 2 Chronicles? 2 Samuel, sorry about that. I find 2 Samuel chapter 11 one of the saddest chapters in the Bible. For those of you who know, it's part of the story of King David. And the story of David starts out so well. He's just this little shepherd boy who's courageous and humble and loves God and God handpicks him and says, you are going to be the king of Israel. You are a man after my own heart. I choose you. He gets anointed king while Saul is still on the throne and even though Saul is a train wreck, David refuses to do anything about it until God does it in his own time. And when David finally becomes king, he's beloved and he's wise and he's gracious and the nation of Israel flourishes under his leadership. And then we get to 2 Samuel chapter 11 and it all comes crashing down. David's army is away at war and he stays back and he's up on the roof of his palace and he sees a woman bathing and he says, the heart wants what the heart wants. And he has her brought to the palace and he commits adultery with her And she becomes pregnant and he tries to cover it up and ultimately has her husband murdered. And he thinks he's gotten away with it. And the next chapter, the prophet Nathan comes and essentially in so many words says, God knows what you did and he's not happy about it. And David is totally broken. And in that brokenness, he writes a prayer to God. And we have that prayer in our Bible. It's Psalm 51. And in that Psalm, he basically says, God, I am so sorry. I've sinned against you and I was wrong. And then we get to verse 10 and this is what he says to God. He says, God, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. David says, I followed my heart to a place it shouldn't have gone and I'm sorry and there's, there's nothing I can do about it, God, except that you do it for me. I need you to clean my heart and renew a right spirit within me. And the amazing thing about it is that God does it. David is still known as a man after God's own heart. He wrote huge portions of scripture. He had a huge downfall, but God gave him a clean heart. And what is so moving about that story is it is all of our stories. We have all blown it. If you haven't blown it yet today, there's a lot of time before bed. (laughs) 
We have all followed our hearts to places we should have never gone. And all we have to do is go to God and say, create in me a clean heart. And he will do it. The amazing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The great irony of the gospel of Jesus Christ is this. That the crimson red blood that he shed on the cross in our place that crimson red blood that would stain anything it comes into contact with can wash us white as snow. All we have to do is go to him and say, God create in me a clean heart and he will do it. As the, as the beautiful words of the, the wonderful hymn, Jesus paid it all, tell us. It says, Lord, now indeed I find thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. We need a heart transplant, and God is the one who can do it for us. Let's pray.